Okay, so we're going to continue our series on spiritual disciplines. So the first one was the word of God, the scriptures. That is the most important one because the scriptures is the one that tells us how to pray, how to fast, how to give. So without the scriptures, we would not know what to pray for. We would not know what God requires of us. So the foundation of every spiritual discipline is the scriptures. So now the second one, which is equally important, is the word, I mean, prayer. Prayer, those two go hand in hand. So we're going to talk about prayer, and it's basically you communicating with God. So through the scriptures, God speaks to you, and through prayer, you speak to God. And also the Holy Spirit can speak to you, you know, to your spirit as you're praying. So biblical examples of prayer. Many of the Psalms are prayers. If you read Psalm 10, 59, 83, 86, and others. They're actually prayers. Now, not all the Psalms are prayers. Some of them, you know, are songs and, uh, and then, you know, worship and things like that. So, but these are Psalms that are prayers. The believers to constantly be in an attitude of prayer. And I just want to read these scriptures so that you can see that the Bible does talk about prayer quite often. So in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says this. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show them that they should always pray and never give up, which implies that us as Christians, if we're going to give up in any area, it's going to be in the area of prayer. Satan will attack your prayer life more than anything else because he knows that that's where your power lies. That's where you receive strength from the Lord. That's where you communicate with God. So if he can cut those lines of communication and get you so distracted that you don't have time to pray, then Satan has won the victory. You might still be a Christian, but eventually your sinful nature will drag you back into your old habits and your old ways. So you got to protect your prayer life. So always pray and never give up. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul the apostle tells them this. After he mentions about the whole armor of God, he says this, pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So from this verse, we could uh, ascertain that when we pray, we actually staying alert spiritually. That's why he says stay alert and be persistent. And it also implies that when you pray, it gives us that strength to be resilient, which means being able to bounce back out of a tough situation. So prayer keeps us alert. And it keeps us, and it gives us an attitude of persistence. It keeps us keeping on even when things get hard. So he said, pray at all times and in every occasion. And that's important because some people pray, especially Christians, only when they're in trouble. In other words, those are called parachute prayers. They, they pull the string out of emergency. Lord, if you get me out of this, please, I will never do this again. Or they try to bargain with God. You know, God does not want us to pray parachute prayers. He wants us to live a lifestyle of prayer, that prayer does not become something that we do to get things from God. It's more something that we do to get closer to God and for us to experience his presence and know what he wants us to do. So he says, pray, stay alert. And if you don't pray, the opposite is true, which means you could be sleeping spiritually. So you don't know what, which way the enemy is going to attack you. And unfortunately, many Christians are sleeping spiritually. And that's why they're constantly falling into sin and into the traps of the devil because they're not alert, you know, in the spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says this. Again, the apostle Paul, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, some people worry about everything and they don't pray about anything. They have that reverse. Paul says, no, don't worry about anything. Instead of worrying, pray about everything. Because when you pray about everything, Whatever you're going through, whatever problem, you're giving that to God. So now it's the problem is in his hands, whether you, you have problems with your spouse or with your children or at work, whatever the problem is, you're taking it out of your hands. And when you pray, you give it to God. And now you're saying, Lord, now this is in your hands. And we know that anything in the hands of God, he knows how to handle the situation. So pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. An attitude of thanksgiving. You know, so we need to stop worrying and start praying more and more so that we can give all our worries unto the Lord. And then in Colossians chapter four, verse two, again, this is the apostle Paul. In all his letters, he mentions something about prayer because it is important for the Christian. It says, devote yourselves to prayer 
with an alert mind and a thankful heart. The same thing he repeated in Ephesians, with an alert mind. When you pray, it keeps your mind alert from the fiery darts of the wicked one. So prayer, it's not saying, you know, I'm going to pray so that Satan won't attack me. No, you're praying so that you're going to be alert. So when the enemy does attack you, which he will, all of us who desire to live godly, Paul says, will suffer persecution. When problems do come, and they will, you have the strength, and you'll be alert spiritually, and the devil will not be able to catch you off guard. So that's what prayer does. It keeps your spiritual antennas on high alert, always uh, spiritually. So 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it can't get any clearer than this. Never stop praying. Now, obviously, it's not talking about being in a room or building a monastery, you know, like in the second and third centuries that they fleed the cities and they started building uh, monasteries, the desert monks, and just praying and reading the Bible in the monastery. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about that you are always in communion with God, whether you're driving to work, whether you're, you're working, you know, and, and dealing with kids or at home or you're in the supermarket, that in your mind, you're always thinking about God and always in communion with God and not necessarily talking, you know, moving your lips. You can be in communion with God, even in your heart, thanking the Lord, you know, so that's what it means to uh, never stop praying. And then I forgot to read a couple of more scriptures. Uh, 1 Timothy 2a, again, all these scriptures are basically uh, on prayer. 1 Timothy 2.8, in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands, lifting up to God, free from anger and controversy. Again, Paul is exhorting Timothy, which he was pastoring the church of Ephesus, to make sure that the men are praying men, that they lift up holy hands and, and allow God to deal with their anger. This is what it says, without wrath or anger or controversy. Don't allow controversies to divide the church. Instead, the men should be praying and seeking God, and as well as the women. But here he's addressing the men in particular, because those are the ones that God has placed, you know, as the spiritual leader, you know, in the church and in the home. So if the men are praying, God is going to move in a powerful way. And also, you know, the women pray as well. And Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6, let me go to access to God through Jesus Christ. To Jesus belongs the believer. Access to God through Jesus belongs to the believer. So everyone that's a believer, if you are a Christian, if you've been born again, if you ask Jesus to come into your life, to forgive you for your sins, and you turn your life around, you did a 180, not a 360, that will put you right back in the same place. But you did a 180, you will go in one direction, you turn your life over to Christ, and now you're heading the opposite direction, which is towards him. We all have access to God. It says, Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we have access to God. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness, so that we can find help in time of need. The man of prayer calls for honest communication, not showy pretense or empty repetition. Listen to what it says, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they, that they're doing wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on the earth. So let your words be few. And then Jesus reiterates the same thing in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. It says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father will seize everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by re repeating their words again and again. In other words, repeating the same prayer again and again, repetition. Jesus said, don't do that. When you pray, pray for out of the abundance of your heart. Pray what you what you believe God is leading you to pray for. Pray according to the scriptures. So Jesus is saying, don't pray uh, set prayers or canned prayers that you repeat over and over again. You know, like the Hail, Hail Mary. I don't know how many come from a Roman Catholic background, but they repeat the same prayer over and over again. That's not really praying. That's repeating, you know, a, a, a 
prayer over and over again. God wants us to pray from our heart. As you talk to somebody, you talk to God just the same way, you know, with honor and reverence, but he wants to hear what's in your heart, not some uh, repeated prayer that you read to him over and over again. So we want to make sure that we come to God with transparency. And then prayer should not be done with an unforgiving attitude. Prayer should not be done with an unforgiving attitude. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11, verse 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you are holding a grudge against anyone, don't pray until you get that fixed, until you forgive that person because your Father in heaven will not forgive you or hear your prayer. So we can't be praying, being resentful and holding grudges against this brother or this sister or you know, an uncle or not, or my mother. And if you have grudges in your heart, you got to get that right before God and forgive that person. If you don't forgive that person, God will not forgive you. And then prayer should be made in confident hope that God hears and knows our real needs. First John chapter five, verse 14 and 15 says this, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So there's the confidence that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to the will of God, not just anything that we want, it has to be according to the will of God. Because if it's not according to his will, he's not going to answer that prayer. Some things that we pray about are not good for us. We don't know that, but God knows that. And he doesn't answer those prayers because he knows it will be detrimental to our own spiritual life. So God only answers prayers that are according to his will, that are in line with his kingdom and his purposes. So God is not there to serve us. We're here to serve him. He is our Lord and Savior. He is our master. So when you become a Christian, you don't inherit, you know, almost like a... a, a glorified uh, Santa Claus, and now you can ask him whatever you want, and he has, has to do it for you, or you approach him with entitlement. It's always according to the will of God, and if you pray with that humility, God will answer your prayer. So the best thing to do goes back to the first lesson, which was the scriptures. The more you know the scriptures, the more you're able to pray according to the will of God. And then in Hebrews eleven six, it says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That's the key phrase right there. Diligently seek him. You're pursuing him. You want to get to know him better. You want to know his will. You want to know what pleases him. Your greatest desire on this earth is to please your heavenly father. When you diligently seek him like that, he will manifest himself to you. He will reveal himself to you. So I always say, if you get serious with God, God will get serious with you. So if you're really diligently seeking him, he's going to reward you. He's going to manifest himself to you. And faith is going to start rising up in your heart. So I encourage you to seek God. Why prayer matters? Now we're going to get into some practical you know, advice. Just I just wanted to share some scriptures. And that's only a few scriptures on prayer. There's so many others that we could have went on. And, and on each of those verses that I just shared, we could have done easy a lesson for 45 minutes or an hour just on one of those verses. But this is not that type of teaching that we're going to get in depth yet. You know, as the lessons go on, then we'll get deeper. So why prayer matters? Prayer is commanded in the Bible. The discipline of prayer is a way to be obedient to this command. So the Bible commands us to pray. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Prayer builds up our humility, dependence on God, and compassion for others. Because when you pray, what happens is that you get filled with the Holy Spirit. When you pray, you begin to have the heart of God. You begin to see things the way God sees things. So it's going to build compassion for others. You're going to build dependence upon God. The more you pray, the more you're going to want to pray because you realize that you need him, not in some things, that you need him in everything. The, the humblest people I know are people that are in deep prayer because they realize that without God, they can't do anything. Without God, they will not be able to be successful. Many of us, 
you know, we, we have jobs, we're working, we have families, and sometimes we take that for granted. Thank God for everything. Everything we have is because heaven has been gracious and good to us. So prayer develops that dependence upon God. Lord, I need you. Thank you today for waking me up. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've given me. Food on the table. You know, all these things that God gives us, and a lot of times we don't thank him for it, and we can have a, an attitude of entitlement. But when you pray, it brings humility. You're humbling yourself before God. Learning about the heroes of the faith may be intimidating. We might feel discouraged with the enormous challenge of the example. So when we read the Bible and we see the heroes of the faith, people that were prayer warriors, we might get discouraged, things like that. But who could fly a jet or run a marathon without much previous and rigorous training? No one is born knowing how to pray. All of us. No, nobody is born knowing how to pray. You learn how to pray. And that's why the disciples approach Jesus and, and ask him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So the apostles had to learn how to pray. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus told him, wait here, pray while I go over there and pray. And then he came back, he found him sleeping. And he told him, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went back to pray. He came back, he found him sleeping again. Prayer was not important to them at that time. They were just hanging out with Jesus, casting out demons under Jesus, anointing, you know, under the blessing of Jesus. But there was going to be a time that they had to learn how to pray. And many of us, like the apostles, you know, fall asleep when, when we're supposed to be praying and all that. But ask the Lord, teach me to pray, Lord. And the Lord will teach you that. And actually, the Bible says that none of us knows how to pray. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, it says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. What's our weaknesses? We don't know what to pray for as we should, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the Christians according to the will of God. He, talking about the Spirit, makes intercession. The Spirit prays through us according to the will of God. So none of us are born knowing how to pray. That's something that we need to learn, and the way you learn how to pray is by praying. That's simple, and by being around people that pray. You just got to do it. Learning to pray is a bit like learning to swim. It can only happen in the water, despite fears, insecurities, and doubts. The only way you're going to learn how to swim, you got to get in the water. You know, you can take courses on swimming. You know, you can have the best professionals sit you down with a PowerPoint presentation all that. None of that's going to do you any good until you get in the water and you actually start swimming on your own and practice. So same thing with prayer. Unless you are praying and start practicing the discipline of prayer, you'll never learn how to pray. You'll get better and better. Prayer requires concentration and focus. Teaching ourselves to concentrate is one of the reasons we close our eyes. Now, you don't have to close your eyes when you pray, but the reason we close our eyes is to close out all the distractions. But we need to close our ears and minds as well to the many distractions around us. You know, that's why we close our eyes. There's so many distractions around us, you know, and, and I know particularly for women, if they try to pray with their eyes open, walking around the house, they're going to end up picking this up. They're going to end up doing the dish. Too much distraction. They're going to end up doing something other than praying. And that's why it's good to close your eyes when you pray. You don't have to, but it helps shut everything out so that you can concentrate on God alone and get rid of all the distractions around you. Spending a few minutes just to quiet our mind and heart will help us achieve better concentration and focus. You know, just a few minutes, just quieting your heart and your mind before you pray, you know, and, and kind of shutting out everything else. No distractions, the TV off, the, the phone, you know, shut it off. Don't be answering texts, you know, people calling you. I know when I got saved, you know, people still had house phones, you know, in their house. Some people, what they used to do is take the phone off the hook when they were praying because they didn't want anybody distracting them. You know, and sometimes you have to do that. And sometimes, you know, shut off your cell phone so that no one can distract you. There's always going to be distractions. So we got to eliminate all those distractions so that we can concentrate on prayer. If praying on your own is difficult, make a prayer date with a friend you are comfortable with. 
Like I said, the, old, the only way you learn how to pray is by praying with other people. Call somebody and start praying or attend the prayer group on Thursday with uh, Bridget. But, you know, there's a few people there. But I don't, if, if you're a little nervous, you just want to pray with one person, then contact a brother or sister and, and pray with them over the phone. And, to, you know, you start getting more confident little by little. But the way I learn how to pray is by being in a prayer meeting. Every Tuesday, my church had prayer and fasting. And I used to attend every Tuesday. I was in the prayer meeting. And there was such a strong spirit of prayer that eventually it gets on you. And then you start praying, you know, and, and real strong. And the Holy Spirit begins to lead you. So if you want to learn how to pray, you got to be in prayer. If you want to learn how to study the Bible, you got to be in Bible studies. If you want to know, learn how to witness, you got to get out there and actually witness to somebody. It's all practicality. So I encourage you, call a brother, sister, and say, look, I want to learn how to pray and intercede. And I know that you're a prayer warrior, you know, and, and get connected. So you learn how to pray. Start by praying simple, short prayers. Pray one minute, take a break and read or sing. Then pray again. So this is different like methods. You can pray maybe a minute or five minutes and then stop, read the scripture, pray the scripture, and then pray again. You know, you can alternate back and forth with the scriptures and prayer. And before you know it, you spend, you know, 30 minutes, you know, in prayer and, and in the scriptures. So this will help you out. Don't feel like I got to pray now. You know, when I first got saved, the guy who mentored me scared, scared me. You know, so I said, now, what do I have to do now? He said, well, now that you're a Christian, you got to read the word and you got to pray, you know, at least an hour a day. And I said, what in the world am I going to say for a whole hour what am i going to be talking about for an hour and he said no as you develop your relationship with god like that will become easy you know as you walk with god and all that and before you know it an hour goes by really fast and he was absolutely right when you get filled with the spirit and with the word of god and you start praying time stands still and before you know it you know you've been praying for an hour an hour and a half it's just so powerful but in the beginning is intimidating. So don't try to pray an hour immediately. It's not the amount of time and length. You know, of course, as you mature, you're praying a little longer and getting a little deeper. But in the beginning, pray for five minutes and then read the word and then pray for another five minutes. And that's going to become to develop little by little. And you're going to get stronger and stronger. And you're going to be able to pray a little longer and a little longer because you're going to have more to talk to God about. You know, there's so much to talk to God about, our spouses, our children, you know, our friends, family members. You know, this one is caught up with, with, with alcohol and, and drugs. There's so many things to, to talk to God about, you know, and spend time with him. So how to pray. When you feel stuck, unmotivated, or without words, pray a prayer from the Bible. The psalm, you know, or the Lord's Prayer, or the, uh, the sinner's prayer, really. I don't like to call it the Lord's Prayer because it says, you know, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And Jesus could never pray that prayer because he never sinned. So it's really the, the disciples' prayer that he taught them how to pray. Nehemiah's prayer and then Solomon's prayer. These are all powerful prayers that we can contextualize to our generation and pray these prayers when you feel stuck. There's prayers in Ephesians. There's prayer in Colossians. And in every scripture you read, you can actually pray that. So if you're reading the story of Abraham that God told him, get out from your country and from your relatives and go to a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. When you're reading a narrative, you say, how am I going to pray that? Well, you contextualize it and you take out the principle from it. You can pray, Lord, as Abraham obeyed you and left everything to follow you and begin a life of faith, not knowing where he was going, but he was trusting you. Lord, help me how to trust you, Lord. Help me how to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. Help me ha not have any reservations or doubt. Help me step out in faith like Abraham did and, and went into the land of Canaan, not knowing where he was going. He was just being led by you, Lord. And help me be like Abraham, Lord. So that's just an example of praying from a narrative. You take, you contextualize it and you bring it to the 21st century. Your prayers don't have to be pretty. The Holy Spirit takes all of your prayers and brings them before God and the Father. So sometimes you hear people pray that are prayer warriors and you might get intimidated. You know, you might feel, man, this is uh, Jesus' little brother, little sister. I can't, I can never pray like that. Don't worry about how pretty the prayer is, you know, or the grammar or misspelled, you know, 
mispronounced words and all that. That doesn't affect God. He answers the motives of your heart. So don't try to make it pretty. And, and I got to pray like this person. They use uh, all these big words and all that. God is not interested in that. God is interested in you praying from your heart and using your own words and being led by the Holy Spirit and allowing God to use you in that area. So don't try to be like other people, how they pray. You know, you pray the way God leads you, of course, according to the scriptures, but don't compare yourself to other people because if not, you're going to get discouraged. Everyone is different, you know, and, and, and prays different. Make sure your prayers include praise for God's greatness. Always praise God, basically mean, you know, thanking God. Gratitude for his gifts. Always pray with a spirit of gratitude. Thank you, Lord, for my family, for my salvation, for my children, for my job. Always be grateful. You know, even us as parents, you know, the thing that aggravates us the most is ungrateful kids, right? You do all these things for them and they feel like you owe that to me anyway. They feel entitled, you know, so God is the same way. You know, when we approach him with an attitude of entitlement, or you have to do this for me, or you owe me this. We want to always have an attitude of gratitude. Petitions for you and others. You're petitioning, Lord, help my aunt that is struggling mentally, and she needs your mercy and your grace. You know, Lord, help my son that's not saved, and he needs to become born again. You know, you petition the Lord. Bring him up before the Lord. Because many times, once they become 18 and over, there's nothing that we can actually do to help them. All we can do really is pray for them. You know, they already kind of are set in their ways. And the only thing we can do is, Lord, grab a hold of their hearts. Save their souls, Lord. And, and petition them before the Lord. Confession of your struggle and sins. Always confess your struggles and your sins to God. He knows them already, but you're being transparent with, with God and yourself when you confess it. God already knows it. it. So confession doesn't really help God. He knows it already. It actually helps you be open and transparent and, and not be deceptive and trying to hide things from God. So always confess your struggles and sins. If you struggle with overeating, tell them, Lord, I struggle with overeating. I need you to help me, Lord. Give me the strength not to fall into temptation. If you struggle with materialism, tell them, Lord, I don't want to be materialistic. Help me be content with what I have, Lord God, and not wanting to have more than others, Lord. Confess your struggles and God will help you. And your sins, any sin that you still might be falling into over and over again, pray, Lord, I need you to deliver me from the sin. I pray that your power, Lord, would, would set me free. Lord, help me overcome this in the name of Jesus. I don't want to continue doing this sin and the Lord will help you. And whatever else the spirit brings to your mind, you know, and that's why it's important to always worship before you pray, you know, put some music on. If you don't know the words, you know, now uh, the iPhone, you can see actually the words in every song, you know, while they're playing in Apple Music. They give you the lyrics and everything. You start singing that. Spend 10 minutes singing unto the Lord and just worshiping the Lord and let the Spirit come upon you. And you're going to see how things that you didn't think about praying, the Holy Spirit will start putting these things in your mind. And you might start praying for people that you haven't seen in a long time. And that's the spirit bringing them to your mind so that you can pray for them. The Apostle Paul tells us to pray continually or pray without ceasing. Is this even possible? Not immediately, just as no one can run a marathon without training, no one can pray continually without training. So the more you depend upon God through prayer, the more you're going to pray. It becomes a habit. And that's why these are spiritual disciplines. You're training yourself to bring every single problem up, up to God. Not only the problems that you think are big, but everything, you bring it up to God. You pray about everything, not just some things, everything, you bring it up to God. You know, Lord, I'm moving here. I need your help with this. So, Lord, help my kid with the math test, Lord. Give him wisdom, Lord, that he'll be. Pray about everything. Be a prayer warrior. Bring everything before the Lord. But as you develop that habit, it will become easier and easier to pray continually throughout the day. Prayer can be a painful mirror. Sometimes while praying, God reveals to us what needs changing or needs to be done in our lives. Now, this is extremely important because when we pray, God begins to show us to ourselves and we begin to see things in ourselves that need to be dealt with. Now, God does not bring these things up to shame us or to make us feel guilty. 
God brings these things up so that we can deal with them. People don't like to deal and confront their own issues. They rather tell somebody else what they need to do instead of confronting their own issues of their heart, whether it be unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, jealousy, you know, lust, you know, all these sins of the heart that no one sees but are there. And as you develop a prayer life, you're going to start seeing these things in your life so that God can begin to bring healing and deliverance in your life because he's trying to produce in us the character of Christ. So prayer is like a mirror. It reveals yourself to you. And prayer can be a battleground. Prayer can be difficult and produce a burden in your spirit. Now, that's when we're doing spiritual warfare, that you feel so burdened. And that's why it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the spirit doesn't even use words. It says groanings, which cannot be uttered. You can't even say the words. You begin to groan in the spirit because there's a warfare going on. There's a battleground, you know, that's taking place in the spirit. You know, even in Jesus, when he was in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that his uh, sweat became as great drops of blood. He was, it, he was distressed praying and interceding there to so an extent, to so to, to such an extent that an angel had to come down and, and help him while he was praying. You can read that in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew and Mark doesn't record that, but Luke records it, that an angel had to come down in the Garden of Gethsemane and strengthen him because he was such in, in a battle praying that it, it produced a burden in his spirit. And sometimes that might happen to us when we get into intercession and the spirit is just praying and crying out through us, you know, that you begin to groan in the spirit. You know, it's a powerful, powerful experience as you deepen your relationship with God, you start interceding and, and uh, enter into that difficult time of prayer. But, and the only way that burden's released is to praying about it. If not, you, ca you carry that burden throughout the day. The only way it finds release and alleviation is, is praying. When you pray, then that burden is released from your spirit. Prayer is transformational. Our prayers are not primarily for changing God's mind about something. Prayer changes our mind about who we are, what we need, and how we please God. So this is, again, crucial for our understanding when it comes to prayer. Prayer is not to change God's mind. We're not going to change his mind. God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present at the same time. So when we pray, we're not changing God's mind. But what happens when we pray, it changes us. And it allows God to do what he already wanted to do, but sometimes is hindered because of our unbelief, because of our own stubbornness, because of our own sin in our life. So God, there's certain things that he's inclined to want to do in our lives, but he won't do it because there's just too much pride. There's too much unforgiveness. There's too much anger hindering that. So when you pray, it, begin to, it begins to change you. It begins to transform you. And now God begins to do what he was already inclined to do anyway and what he wanted to do. So it's not like we have the power to change God's mind. You know, it changes us. And that's the most powerful thing about prayer. It brings transformation to our own lives. So now we begin to pray more and more according to the will of God. And we think we're changing God, but in reality, he's changing our mindset, how we see things, how we view things. He's changing us out of from a self-centeredness mentality to a God-centered mentality. He begins to transform us. So prayer, you're not going to twist God's arm and make him do something that he doesn't want to do. But there's a lot of things that God wants to do and, and a lot of prayers that he wants to answer, but we are just not ready for it because there's still too much flesh and, and attitude and self-centeredness that it does not allow God to move in our lives because if he would do what he wants to do and, and bring that blessing to our lives, our pride and our arrogance won't give him the glory. We think we have attained it on our own strength and God will not share his glory with anyone. The glory always belongs to God. Now I want to close with this uh, quote by Ian Bounds. Prayer should not be regarded as a duty to perform, but rather as a privilege to be enjoyed. A rare delight is always revealing some new beauty. So powerful quote. And I just want to recommend two books. Ian Bounds is excellent on prayer. And this book right here is The Complete Works of Ian Bounds. It's actually eight books in this one book, and it's about 20 bucks. Now, Ian Bounds lived in, uh, 
1835, he was born and he was a lawyer. He was a chaplain and he was also a pastor. But Ian Bounds, the last 17 years of his life, he spent it reading, uh, writing, and praying. He had a prayer life every day from four in the morning to seven in the morning, 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And after that, he would give himself over to writing, you know, books and things like that. So powerful. You know, you would think, how much can he say on prayer? Well, he has eight books in this one book on prayer. You think he's going to run out? God gives him so much wisdom and so much revelation on prayer. I encourage you to get it. It's written in contemporary English, because remember in 1835, and at that time, the English was different, but they translated it so you could understand it, a profound book. I have it myself. So that's the first one, Ian Bounds on prayer. It's about 20 bucks. And then the Spirit Helps Us Pray, a biblical theology of prayer. So this goes through every single scripture that talks about prayer, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and then to contemporary life. Every single verse, every type of prayer that was uttered, it's a theology of prayer, how the spirit helps us pray and intercede. Another one that is uh, good to get, I know when I went to college, this was a course. It was called Theology of Prayer. And this was the textbooks that I had to get in order to, uh, to pass that class. And unfortunately, even today in a lot of Bible schools, there's no uh, class on prayer. And this should be essential. They should be a course just on prayer because if you don't know how to pray, everything else as a Christian is going to be basically in vain. You're not going to be able to conquer the flesh. You're not going to be able to walk in the spirit. You're not going to be able to move in the gifts of the spirit. You're not going to be able to accomplish everything that God has for you. This is the most important thing. If you don't learn how to pray and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to stumble as a Christian the rest of your life. You're going to struggle with the same issue over and over again. So I believe this should be a mandatory course, especially in every Christian college. I don't know why they, they don't have that, but the college I went to, they did have it, and it was a great course, and they had a prayer chapel that was open 24-7, and people can just go and spend time there in prayer, you know, and there was always, you know, prayer going around. So these two books, so I'm going to close there, and then we're going to open it up for questions and 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 comments.